What's up? Welcome back into the Letterman Lounge for Letterman Live. Andy Pax from the other side of that screen. It's Spencer Holbrook. And Andy, I don't know if you know this. We got a big one this week. About to hop in the car <laughs> in about an hour after this live show to drive to Ann Arbor. I'm extremely excited. I've never actually been inside the big house before. This will be my first rivalry game at Michigan. Uh, last year's game was in the shoe, of course, and that's the first time Ohio State lost in Columbus since 2000 to Michigan. So there's a lot on the line here. I think there's a lot on the line for this 2021 recruiting class for Ohio State that has done so much for this team, but it's yet to have this win against Michigan. There's a lot on the line for Ryan Day, who seems like he absolutely needs a win in this series at this moment, given everything that's happening in Ann Arbor, given his circumstances with taking over the job from Urban Meyer, who was so dominant against Michigan. And uh, even a little recruiting wrinkle in there, choosing Kyle McCord over J.J. McCarthy, of course, is the star quarterback at Michigan. So there are so many storylines within this game, Spencer, that I think are really intriguing, but so much pressure on both sides. Uh, yeah, the word pressure is almost uh, the name of the game this week, right? Like, you know, uh, the folks over at the Wolverine uh, cover Michigan for on three uh, wrote a story on, I think, Sunday or Monday about who has more pressure, and it was obviously Ohio State. They, they talked about how Ryan Day has more pressure to beat Michigan uh, without Jim Harbaugh on the sideline. Uh, I kind of wrote a counter column to that, but but it wasn't really directed at those guys. It was more just directed at the idea of pressure and, like, who has more. Um, that's on the website, lettermanrow.com, I wrote on Monday. Um, and I, I think that the where the pressure lies doesn't really matter. The pressure is amped for both sides. And, like, the idea of who has more – I just don't think that matters because for Michigan, you're trying to validate the last two years, um, you know, without the sign stealing. For Ohio State, you're trying to validate the sign stealing as like a big advantage. And Ohio State controls this rivalry unless Michigan uh, has an advantage um, nefariously. So like the pressure is on both sides. For Ryan Day, it's like, okay, if you lose this game, you have a big Michigan problem with or without Jim Harbaugh. If you're Michigan and you lose this game, Hey, you just lost at home. You're everybody that you have is probably going to the NFL and Jim Harbaugh might not be there next year. So like the, the pressure is just so amplified and last year was a big game, but we thought the loser would probably still go to the college football playoff. Um, this year, that's not going to happen. And the stakes for this are as high as they could possibly be. And I, I just, I can't wait, man. I can't wait. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it maybe feel like that, but I, I think when Michigan beat Ohio State last year, I think we were pretty certain that Ohio State was not going to college football playoff. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, yeah, there was a possibility. Said, yeah, but I think we were all saying it's not going to happen. I mean, Ohio State needed a ton to go its way. I mean, I, I think it's hard to remember because it did all go Ohio State's way, but I remember leaving yeah. that stadium and we were talking about what bowl, what New Year's Six bowl we were going to be covering that, that wasn't the college football playoff. Uh, mm -hmm. Ohio State was very fortunate to have Utah come through for it in the Pac-12 championship, beating USC for the second time that season. So it's actually kind of similar feeling for me. I mean, yes, the college football playoff field is stronger this year. The candidates to get in, it certainly feels like there's even less of a chance. But I remember last year covering that game after that 45-23 defeat, there was no CFP talk. It, it was basically, well, that door is shut. So I, it is similar in that way a little bit. Um, you know, I, I just don't see Ohio State getting that extra help this time. But so it's not only the ticket to the Big Ten championship program also wants. I mean, every time we're in the Woody Hayes Athletic Center, you'll, you still see that 2020 banner when they beat Northwestern from the COVID year. It feels a little stale at this point. I mean, this is a program that was churning out Big Ten championships year after year. And to still see a 2020 big banner in that facility that of course they're in every single day. I think that's thing that's motivating them too. They want to win the big 10 title. Of course, you got to beat Michigan in this game to do so. Yeah. And you like, I joined this beat in 2019 and they had won the big 10 title in 2017. They won it in 2018. They went in 2019. They went it in 2020. And it's like, okay, this is never ending. Like Michigan can't beat Ohio state. They just ducked the game in 2020. Uh, Ohio State's going to continue to dominate the Big Ten forever and ever and ever because the recruiting rankings don't show anything different and the product on the field doesn't show anything different except 2021 was different. And then, okay, that's a, a blip in the radar because that game was at home for Michigan. It was uh, it was snowing. Ohio State's not built for that. But next year it's in the horseshoe and you're going to get them. And C.J. Stroud will be a second-year player, all-world caliber quarterback, obviously now 
looking at that, you know, all these receivers are back, Marvin Harrison Jr. and Emeka Buka, and the defense should be better because Jim Knowles. And then what happened in the horseshoe last year was just so, so deflating. And so, like, you haven't won the Big Ten, really, I think, since 2019, because the 2020 year was fine. But, like, and you, you, they were the best team in the Big Ten, obviously. But, like, that was just such a wonky year that, like, 2020 in general, I just don't really count a whole lot. Um, so, like, you haven't won a normal Big Ten since 2019. And, like, that that has to sit with the program. Like, Ryan Day, um, he's been here the, the entire time. Guys like Brian Hartline have been here the entire time. And they just haven't gotten it done. So, like, the idea of going on the road, playing the villain, finally getting back at Michigan and being able to go up there and get a win to get back on top of the Big Ten because, obviously, I think the winner is going to beat Iowa. Um, it That motivation in itself should be enough. The winged helmet should be enough. And, oh, by the way, you're both undefeated in two versus three and the sign stealing and they're accusing Ryan Day and everything that comes with it. Like, it's just – like, we could sit here for an hour, Andy, and talk about storylines, and we wouldn't cover half of them. Yeah, absolutely. I think Tim May, our colleague, said it best that the roads through Indiana this season, you start the season at Indiana, you play at Notre Dame, you play at Purdue, and then, of course, you want to win that game in Indianapolis in the Big Ten Championship, which would be – you know, even more of a lock to send you to the college football playoff. Whoever wins that Big Ten championship game, whether it would be Ohio State or Michigan, I feel like we we believe that's going to be the case, uh, would beat the Big Ten West team, which is Iowa. You know, then you're going into the CFP at 13-0, and 0, and you have all the momentum in the world that you would ever need. So I think that there is so much about this team, about the way the schedule has been formed. I think, you know, I'm just looking ahead to the 2024 schedule, and it's just like, uh, like three non-con games against you know I know I know you love the Mac uh, I think we can all appreciate Mac action but you start off the season with back-to-back Mac opponents you played Marshall those games are all at home I mean to have the non-conference schedule they had you, know, you go to Notre Dame I think having that home and home series was great for this program uh, it strengthened the CFP resume that's that's the reason why they got into the CFP last year even though they lost to Michigan was because they played and beat a Notre Dame team so this year they go on the road to beat Notre Dame. They go on the road to beat Wisconsin. They start the year on the road to beat an Indiana team, which I get it, Indiana's not good, but you're still playing a Big Ten game on the road to start the season. It set the stage for everything this team has done with, A, winning on the road, winning in a hostile environment, which they have to do this Saturday in Ann Arbor. And it also set the tone for this defense, which gave up only three points in that game and made a statement to say, hey, we can do this. Now, if they had started the season against – Marshall or maybe Western Michigan and you give up three points that doesn't make a statement to anyone I mean you could shut out a Mac team and and no one's going to take notice but if you only give up three points to a Big Ten team I don't care what Big Ten team that makes a statement especially when you weren't expecting the triple to read and adapt and and adjust in the second year of the defense yeah and like the schedule We've talked about this all year, Andy. The schedule set up perfectly for Ohio State versus Michigan, right? Like, Michigan had the easiest schedule, one of the easiest schedules in the Power Five. Um, As far as, like, non-con that go into your conference. Who you play in conference, you can't really – I don't fault Michigan for the the conference schedule. You can't really do anything about that. Like, Nebraska sucks. It's not Michigan's fault. Minnesota sucks. It's not Michigan's fault. Rutgers is Rutgers. Maryland is Maryland. Like, the Big Ten schedule is fine. But, like, the non-con for Michigan is set up so easily for them to just get to – Veterans Day, play Penn State. Okay, you get through that one, then you get the Ohio State game. For Ohio State, it's set up where everything – the roadblocks were perfectly set up, right? You had one in September, one in October, one in one in November. You know what's coming at the end of November, but the rest of the schedule just kind of lined up, you know, September 23rd, October 21st, November 25th. Like four weeks apart every time you had a big one. And I think that the schedule was just perfect for this team to – kind of earmark it. It's like, hey, we got through this one. Okay, let's move. Uh, let's get better the next two weeks, get to the next one. Okay, we got through that one. Get better the next three weeks, get to the next one. I, I just think that the, it couldn't have worked out better for Ohio State the way that this has been able to work as a slow build up to Michigan the whole year. The offense has been building up too, and I think that that's been important for this program. I think we all expect it. I mean, every storyline this offseason was about the defense, and is the defense going to be good in year two of Jim Knowles, and is it – not going to be anything reminiscent of that collapse that we saw against Michigan and against Georgia where they allowed their most yards per play per game in program history in both of those games. And really it's been more, is the offense going to catch up to the defense? And I think that's, that's the big question 
all season. And I think the last few weeks, it's a little hard to tell because you're playing, you know, teams that are bottom dwellers in the Big Ten, but against Michigan State and against Minnesota, you, you saw what you would like to see from this offense. I also thought there were signs and Rutgers, and, and Ryan Day talked about that too. I mean, maybe it was a little bit harder to see, but it, there were signs of progress from Kyle McCord. There were signs of progress from this offense. And I think if you're an Ohio State fan, you have to feel a lot better about this offense going into this weekend than maybe you did a month ago, mainly because this offensive line is no longer a talking point, which means that the offensive line is a lot better. Uh, absolutely, the offensive line is a lot better. Um, I think Justin Fry would probably throw up if you put the Indiana game back on film right now, <laughs> considering what it looked like. If you put the Maryland game on especially, Justin Fry might be stabbing his own eyes out uh, after watching that compared to where they're at right now, like the steps that they've taken. And I know a lot of us, myself included, uh, I, I would love – maybe you in there, but not as hard, but like the rest of the media. And, and, you know, we have a lot of friends that cover Ohio state, but we've all been really hard on Carson Hinsman, but like, even he has taken like steps forward and maybe he might be behind compared to the rest of the offensive line, but like the entire line as a collective unit, five, five guys playing together have gotten so much better. Uh, you see it in combo blocks. You see it in the way that they get to the second level uh, in tandem and get there together and hit blocks at the right time. Like the running game seems to just be, I don't know. It seems to be cooking right now. And that leads me into one of the biggest talking points of this entire game, because Andy, the best stat of this rivalry, there have been incredible receivers. Uh, you could go down, right on down the line, whether it's on the Michigan side, Donovan Peoples Jones, uh, Braylon Edwards, uh, the, the tandem, uh, Nico Collins, Amara Darbo, and those guys from a couple years ago, like Mario Manningham for the Ohio state side. Do we even need to get into it from San Antonio Holmes to the Bryans with Robisky and Hartline to, uh, you know, Chris Olave, Garrett Wilson, all of those guys, Marvin Harrison Jr. But the last 28 games in this rivalry, which is just a bizarre, crazy thing that happens. When it comes down to it, you got to play Big Ten football. 28 straight games, whoever runs the ball better wins the game. Whoever has more rushing yards wins the game. These two teams are really good at stopping the run. Whoever runs the ball better is going to win this game. Ohio State has been dump trucked the last two years <laughs> in the rushing game. And they, they ran the ball pretty well last year co compared to the year before, but I think they ran for 60 yards the year before. Michigan ran for like $6 billion. Um, so whoever wins the rushing battle, I think is probably going to win on Saturday. And so can Ohio State win the rushing battle against the team that only wants to run the ball? Yeah, I mean, we'll see. We, we were saying that Michigan was only going to run the ball last year, and then in the first half, J.J. McCarthy yeah. threw the ball down the field seemingly more than he had all season. So – I'm not sure you ever really know what's going to happen. But then again, Michigan yeah. ran the ball 30, 32 straight times against Penn State to win that game. So you could see either or. Um, I think the, the interesting thing about this Michigan rushing offense is we were all expecting it to even take a step forward from last year. I think the offensive line has taken a step back for Michigan. And I think those running backs, just quite frankly, in Donovan Edwards and Blake Horham haven't been quite as dynamic. I know Blake Horham is still a touchdown machine. He's still a very good player. So is Donovan Edwards, but they're not as explosive as they were. Part of that's the offensive line. Part of that's just their running ability. Uh, but that rushing offense is still very good. It's just not as spectacular as I think we all expected it to be. Then again, Ohio State's rushing offense was a major work in progress, like a construction site, basically the entire first half of the season. And it wasn't until Travion Henderson returned from injury that it really was the jolt that that unit needed to get going and and i think that it's twofold i think that travion henderson gave it life but i also think that the offensive line fed off of that life and has been significantly better since then so you know i think what's what's tricky is that with this run defense for ohio state as good as it's been there have been times sometimes at the end of a half sometimes at the beginning of a game where it has given up these chunk runs now they've only given up one 40 yard plus run but they've given up eight of 20 or more and we've seen it against Purdue at the end of the half. We've seen it at the beginning of the game against Michigan State. We've seen it, you know, at Notre Dame. There have been times where this offense or this run defense has been a little bit leaky. And I think that's a concern of mine going into this game. Yeah, and Ohio State's got to get that short up um, because, like, you can't have what you had against Purdue on that first drive against Michigan because Michigan's going to score a touchdown on that drive. I know Purdue missed a field goal on that opening drive, but, like, 
Michigan's not – that's not going to happen. Michigan's kicker's good. Michigan's red zone offense is good. They don't – you know. Uh, so I know how good Ohio State is in the red zone, but, like, Michigan's just as good down there on offense. So, like, you've, you've got to be good against the run. You've got to set the tone because here's the thing, Andy. Like, if Michigan can run the ball in the first drive, they're going to run on the second drive. And they're going to run on the third drive. And then they're not going to pass. They, if they don't have to, they're not going to pass, especially under Sharon Moore, who's shown us in two games already that if he doesn't have to pass, he's not passing. It's just, it's, it's just not – it's not going to happen. He doesn't need – if they don't need J.J. McCarthy to win him a game, he's not going to try to win a game. So, like, the one thing that I do find interesting, Andy, Michigan last year had nine games over 200 yards rushing, which is insane. This year, they have three. And so, like, that kind of gives you an idea of, like, where this unit is. It's not – like you said, it's not what it was last year. So, I think Ohio State is better against the run than they have been the last couple of years. And Michigan is worse at running the ball, relatively, because they're still really good at running the ball. But they're worse relatively at running the ball than they have in the last two years. So can Ohio State get that to more of a level? That's where I think you're going to see this defense thrive if you can get that more to a level. Because I know what happened last year. I've rewatched the game twice already this week, let alone in the rewatches last year, in the immediate aftermath of that train wreck that was the second half and like the first half with the blunders and stuff. If Ohio State is going to win this game, they're going to make J.J. McCarthy beat him. And I don't know if they think he can do it twice. So he beat him last year, kind of, because he kept them in the game in the first half, and Donovan Edwards ran free in the second half. But, like, Ohio, I think if I'm Ohio State, I take my chances in, with, your, with that good of a pass defense that you have. Don't let the run beat you. Make J.J. McCarthy be the one that beats you. Well, I think a lot of it last year, they did sell out to stop the run, and they did for the first half. And then it was the second half where they could not stop the run. They couldn't stop anything in the second half. But I think that, you know, it was really the aggression of Jim Knowles that was boom or bust, right? Like, they helped them stop the run, but it also resulted in some massive plays. If there was three 45-plus-yard touchdown passes, I know one was off of a missed tackle Um right near the sideline there that turned into a huge touchdown for Cornelius Johnson. So like, I get that, but that's part of the aggression. Right. And so Jim Knowles has shifted his philosophy from that. Like he's not playing the feast or famine. So I don't, I don't know if they're going to go and be like, we're going to stop the run. Like, I I think that, yeah, you got to stop the run, but I don't think you can sell out like they did last year. Like, I think if you just hedge your bets on like, Hey, we're just going to make JJ McCarthy beat us. Like, I don't know if that's the right strategy because I, he, he beat them last year. Like, I, I think that needs to be a little bit more balanced than that and a less less of a, like, we're just going to throw everything we have at it uh, and more, I guess, tactical. And that's what they've well, been this season. I think part of that equation, though, is Ohio State thinking it's much better this year on the back end. So you don't have to put – Ohio State knew – there were deficiencies in the back end last year. Jordan Hancock wasn't healthy. Denzel Burke wasn't himself because he wasn't healthy. Cameron Brown was who he was. He's a nice player, but he's not a an all Big Ten guy like I think they have right now. And Denzel Burke and Davidson Igbenosin is probably going to get second or third team All Big Ten. You know, maybe even honorable mention. But still, he's going to have his name in there. I, I think he's a better player than than Cam Brown was last year. And that's again not a knock on Cam Brown. He's a good player, but I think Ohio State trusts its defensive backs more this year, and that's part of the equation of like saying make JJ McCarthy beat you is like. If you trust your defensive backfield more than you did last year, you're more willing to live in a world where you're manned up and you have guys up to stop the run. You have your linebackers being aggressive against the run because you know that your back end is going to take care of you much better than it did at times last year. And so that's part of the equation in my mind is like Jim Knowles can probably have, you know, if he needs to a five man surface, he can have, uh, you know, aggressive defensive ends getting up, getting, making sure that they're setting the edge and stopping the run. He can have linebackers filling holes much easier because he has a lot of faith in the back end. And I don't know if we saw that last year because you were trying to get JJ McCarthy off his spot with all these exotic blitzes and going crazy and sending the house because you knew if Michigan did throw the ball, they probably could get a little bit. And so that's part of the equation in my mind. It's like, that's what it means to make JJ McCarthy beat you. Because not only is it JJ McCarthy, throwing the ball but he's throwing into this secondary in particular which i think is a winning formula for ohio state if you can get him to throw the ball well a matchup we should probably talk about too is the, the tight end of michigan colson loveland burned ohio state last year and he's yeah one of the tight ends in the big 10 ohio state's had trouble with tight ends at times this season and you know the notre dame game is the one you brought up this week when we we're talking about this matchup and 
you know, Mitchell Evans had a day against Ohio State. And these linebackers for Ohio State are part of that coverage, as good as maybe the defensive backs have been for Ohio State. Well, hey, the linebackers are going to be part of this equation here of defending the pass. And uh, I guess we can get into that a little bit. I mean, what do you see from Colson Loveland, the Michigan tight ends, and that part of the passing attack? The weirdest thing about Colson Loveland to me, Andy, is like, this is not a knock on him whatsoever. Like, he doesn't do anything, like, special. He's just, like, markedly more efficient than most tight ends in the country. He, he's got a li- – it kind of reminds me a little bit of what Cade Stover does. Like, Cade's not a tactical route runner that's going to just put a defensive back or a linebacker on skates. But he gets open because he's efficient in the way he does it. He's not a great blocker, but he's efficient because he gets in front of people and keeps people in front of him to make sure that he's sustaining a block long enough to let Trayvon Henderson go. When you have the running game you do, you don't have to be a perfect blocker. You just have to be a good blocker and a willing blocker. And Colson Loveland is that, and he's an efficient guy in the passing game. And he, most receivers, like slot receivers, I used to call Jackson Smith and Jig like slippery. Colston Loveland's kind of like slippery. Like you don't really realize he's open until you see him streaking right down the middle of the field. And it's like, where, where did that guy come from? And he's just wide open. And Michigan does a good job of scheming that up. It's so like, that's the thing to me is like, not only do you have to know where he is, but it sounds pretty elementary, but you got to keep an eye on him at all times because he's going to slip out of, slip out of a running formation on play action and beat you deep. He's going to, somehow manage to get open down the sideline and you're going to be like how did that guy get open we were in perfect coverage so like he's he's good and and i like to watch him he's a fun player to watch um and i expect to see a lot of sunny styles uh and steel chambers against colston loveland uh tomorrow and then there's aj barner too of course transfer from indiana Mm -hmm. who came in and he's had 19 catches this year he's also part of that offense and you know we saw him at ohio stadium last year pretty much Moss, Cameron Brown in the end zone there. Cameron Brown actually had a bounce back day after that and had a pretty good game, probably one of his better games. But that was a moment that caught my eye. I think it caught everyone's eye. And Of course, he ends up transferring to Michigan. He has a part in that offense as well. So there's two tight ends. We know how much they like to use 12 personnel, 13 personnel. Um, we, we've seen them in that, you know, all sorts of heavy packages this season, especially against Penn State when they were just trying to run the ball, extra offensive linemen, extra tight ends. The tight ends are so integral to that offense. Of course, Roman Wilson, though, is is their top wide receiver. And he's someone that, you know, he commands a lot of respect in the league, across the country. And they're going to have him seemingly healthy enough to play in this game. And I think that's also something to watch out for. Like, is he going to have one-on-one matchups? Is he going to win in those matchups? Who's going to be covering him? Are they going to have Denzel Burke on him? Are they going to have, you know, him traveling I, I don't know I mean that that doesn't really happen as much in the Big Ten anymore like I guess that's a matchup that I'm interested in as well to watch yeah he's another guy you would just define as like slippery right he's he's got a lot of touchdowns because they get him open they scheme him open they, they know what kind of weapon he is and he's very good after the catch and so I think it's going to be key for Ohio State tackling tackle 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 again Cam Brown makes that tackle on Cornelius Johnson last year Michigan's looking at a punt and you're getting the ball back with a lead already for Ohio State, and Michigan doesn't have any momentum. And they're punting yet again because they couldn't run the ball in the first half, and then they were having trouble throwing the ball until J.J. McCarthy throws a prayer off his back foot to Cornelius Johnson. You miss a tackle, and you're gone. Roman Wilson will do that, and so will Cornelius Johnson. He's in this game too. He hasn't been that great this year, uh, which is interesting. He's a good player, um, but he's not the caliber of wide receiver that like Ohio State fans are used to seeing every Saturday. Roman Wilson's not either, but he gets open. And so if you can make tackles – these guys don't run like a lot of go routes. They don't run a lot of like deep 60 yard, uh, you know, aerial assault passes uh, and routes. This is like a, a, a unit that loves yards after the catch. They love getting just getting open. And so just make a tackle. The safeties have been good tacklers all year. All year. The corners have been good tacklers all year. If you can tackle in this game, you're probably going to have some success against the Michigan passing attack, even if they're moving the ball. And then you take your chances in the red area where Ohio State's defense has been good all year. They're going to move Roman Wilson around. He's in the slot 66% of the time. So, again, to my point earlier, like, I don't think this is a Denzel Burke v. Roman Wilson. Like, you're probably going to see some Jordan Hancock and Roman Wilson. You're probably going to see uh, maybe even, like, a little bit of Jahad Carter, like, if they put him in nickel for a little bit. Uh, there, There's all sorts of matchups I'm sure you'll see. And that's the way these matchups usually turn out. Uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. was even saying, like, the only corner that's really ever just been with him the whole game is Kalen King of Penn State. Um, and Marvin still won that matchup. But 
I do think that it is something to note of just where these guys will be. And I agree with you, keeping the ball in front of them. I mean, that's been the whole name of the game this season is limiting those explosive plays. Of course, I mean, I can't even believe we have mentioned it by now, but five touchdowns of 40 or more yards that Ohio State gave up last year to Michigan. And the entire story of the offseason is how do you limit those explosive plays? Actually, how do you eliminate those explosive plays. And for the most part of this season, they have. They've only allowed one play, 40 or more yards, and that was that fumble ruski esque trick play on the tush-push formation at Rutgers. And that's just going to happen. So only one of those, though, and that's that's the fewest in the country, only on one other team, and that's Rutgers, is allowed uh, two. And then the rest of the country is allowed at least four. So Ohio State has made a huge correction on that. And part of that's keeping the ball in front of them in the pass game. And so, yeah, I agree with you. As long as you're making the tackles, which this unit has, they're going to be happier with making a team drive the length of the field and score a touchdown than to give up those big plays. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, we need to get into to, uh, keys to the game because this, this thing is flying by. I'm having so much fun talking about this game. It's, it's kind of flying by keys to the game, Andy. Um, I'll, I'll just start in that exact spot because it's a good transition. Mark Ohio state gave up touchdowns of 69, 75, 45, 75, and 85 last year. Um, insane when you look at the stats on six plays versus the stats the rest of the game Ohio State's defense did a really nice job on Michigan down to down last year and then a big play blew it all up and it didn't matter so like if you win down to down you cannot throw that all away on a big play so I know that Ohio State's been the best big play defense in the country this year but Ohio State was also decent defensively last year and none of it mattered in this game because this game is different do not let Michigan have a long touchdown. Because if you do, that's how you get the crowd involved. That's how Mr. Brightside comes out. That's how the, the crowd in Ann Arbor is going to go nuts. And then you're going to be in a hole no matter what. Even if you're up 10 nothing, if they get a long touchdown, the momentum completely flips. Last year, the first long touchdown was a precursor for things to come, but it also served as an immediate, immediate uh, momentum changer uh, in the intensity of, in the tense nature of the horseshoe ramped up so my first key to the game is i know you've been good against big plays all year it doesn't matter what you've done all year 11 games do not mean anything you can be 0 and 11 and give up every big play if you limit big plays and win this game no one cares so do not allow big plays it's the balancing act because jim knows talked about it this week you don't want to allow the big plays so you do want to play it safer in a sense in the back end but you also can't just give them the room to run the ball so you have to find the balance there. And that's what I said earlier in the show. Like, I don't think they can sell out to stop the run because when you do that, that's when you give up the big play in the back end. So like, I think there are so many ways you look at this game, but I think that was a key comment from Jim Knowles. It's like trying to find the balance. I don't think we'll see him as aggressive as last year. And, uh, but he's got to be aggressive enough, right? <laughs> aggressive, but not overly. Yeah. I think my key to the game is the red zone offense for Ohio State. It has been lacking for much of the year. It was better of late. Then we saw some hiccups again against Minnesota, which does not have a very good red zone defense. Michigan, however, has the number one red zone defense and opponent touchdown percent in the red zone. They're only giving up 33.3% touchdowns on red zone trips. That's six total red zone touchdowns they've given up on 18 red zone trips. They don't allow people to get into the red area often, and when they do, they buckle down in Ohio State has just not been super efficient in scoring touchdowns There's been way too many times. They've just settled for field goals in that area. I think they're hovering around the 60-some percent mark right now in, in terms of converting those trips into touchdowns. It needs to be more efficient than that just because I don't think they're going to get that many red zone trips at Michigan. And we'll get into it later, I'm sure, in terms of like how we see this game going. But I'm expecting it to be a lower scoring game. And when you do get to the red zone, you got to cash in for a touchdown and not a field goal. Yeah, which leads – great question from Jeff. How does Ohio State get the receivers open downfield, especially if the safeties are playing deep? The best thing about the red zone is if you don't have to go there, you shouldn't go there. So if you can get your guys open, Marvin Harrison Jr. is the best receiver in college football. I saw Caden Prather two different times last week for Maryland get open down the field against Will Johnson. And he had one-on-one, -on -one and he beat him and torched him deep. And one of them was a touchdown. One of them was a bad throw. If Talia Tungavailoa could throw the ball uh, at um, a Big Ten level, you know, consistently, I think Maryland might have won that game last week. 
there is there are big plays to be had against this Michigan secondary, and that's not just because of Marvin Harrison Jr. It's because Rutgers had a big play on him. It's because I think Bowling Green had a big play on him. It's because Maryland had big plays on him. Like they're not like susceptible to just give up a ton of long balls, but you can scheme one up. And if you're Ryan Day, like I trust Ryan Day to get one. He got one to Marvin Harrison Jr. last year. I think it was a 46 yard touchdown pass or 41 yards. It was right around the 40. You can get them. You just have to be very uh, picky about when you choose to try to get them. So, like, I love the red zone point, Andy, because if you get down there, you better score. But if you don't have to go to the red zone, that's the best cure for a red zone. And so, like, if you can pop a 28-yard Travion Henderson run and the field doesn't shrink and you still get in the end zone, that's awesome. If you can get a a ball to Marvin Harrison Jr. or a Mecca Ibuka streaking down the middle of the field like he did last week and a guy doesn't make a tackle – you're looking at a long touchdown or a long gain that gets you inside the five, and then you can take your chances there. So, like, I think there's a way that Ohio State can scheme some stuff to try to get a big play or two, loosen some things up. That way, even when they do get in the red zone, like, you can run the ball a little better. You can be a little better there just be by default because you've loosened up that Michigan defense. That's my second key to the game is get the ball to your best players and trust your best players. I think the last two years in this game, Ryan Day – has not exactly trusted his best players maybe as much as he should have. I know he didn't have the run game last year because Chip Trainum was the lead back, but like I think Emeka had six catches for 100 yards, and most of those were in the first half because, you know, I, Marvin Harrison Jr. had the long touchdown. He had over 100 yards, but it seemed like that production was a lot of first half stuff that CJ Stroud did. And in the second half, they, they didn't get him the ball well enough. Um, so maybe that's a little bit of the sign stealing and, and second half adjustments, but I think you got to trust your best players in this game. Big time players make big time games, make big time plays. Marvin has talked about this the entire year, how he wants to beat Michigan. Feed him the ball. He's going to get open. Feed him Mecca Buka the ball. He's going to get open. And and if you do that, I think you got a good chance. Well, and, and maybe more to, to Jeff's question as well. I want to get back to that real quick first is that I, I think you might be referring to like the too high safety shell we've seen multiple mm-hmm. teams go this year. The way to attack that is is really the middle of the field, the heart of the zone. I mean, it's like a cover two look, and you want to find the gap between those safeties and the linebackers. And I think the one piece they were missing was Kate Stover against Rutgers, which if you're trying to find big gains in the middle of that defensive look, it's a tight end or a receiver in the slot in the middle of the field where they can sit down on a route in that zone and make a defense pay. Well, they didn't have Kate Stover against Rutgers. I think he would have really helped. And I think uh you know, we'll see that if Michigan does go with that look, which I'm not sure they will, but if they do, you do have Kate Silver, who has been much more sure-handed this year than he was last year. I know the drop he had last year in the end zone against Michigan, which would have totally changed the game. I mean, there were so many plays you can look at the, the G Scott headbutt had it not happened, the fake punt that was, you know, just not executed correctly. There were there was all sorts of things that could have changed the game. But one of them was that Kate Silver drop. He has been so much better catching the football this year. Uh, he's ca- He caught 34, the, 34, 40 targets so far this year. He's up there among the top tight ends in the country in terms of reception percentage. So that is just something that is uh, a little bit different. And, and it goes to your point about getting the ball to your best players. Kate Silver is one of those players. He needs to be involved in this offense, especially if they're facing a look that Jeff was mentioning. Well, remember also the fourth and two last year. They throw CJ throws a little bit off to Kate Stover. Kate Stover has it in his hands and it gets dropped because defender played it well. If Kate Stover catches that, Ohio State might go up. Um, I think it was seven to three at that moment. Ohio State might go up 14-3. You know, and and then you're looking at an entirely different game because then Jim Knowles might not want to be as aggressive with a two-score lead already. So like the things that determined that game last year, just, like especially the first half. You watch back that first half, and I know it'd be painful for Ohio State fans to go back and watch. But if you turn it off at halftime, you might not be as as angry because they were winning at halftime. Like, <laughs> uh, they played really well, and they they just had a couple little things here and there um, that cost them the first half and cost them a big lead. They were up twenty to seventeen. They could have been up twenty eight or even thirty one to set to uh, seventeen at the half. Or in the game script changed so much, you might be up. 31 to 10 or 28 to 10 um, if you're capitalizing on that first half uh, better than you did. Um, This is a key that we've got to talk about at least a little bit. We've talked about ad nauseum. I'm not sure how much more we absolutely have to hammer on it just because like, it's kind of like beating a dead horse at this point, but like, are we worried about the O line against their D line? Yes. Yes. Um, We worried about Ohio state's offensive line against Penn state's defensive line. And 
Buckeyes held up pretty well. Even Carson Hensman. I know that Penn State is a little light in the light in the butt. I would say they're a little light up front on defensive tackle. Michigan is not, um, and so they will they will get after you. Kenneth Grant is good. Mason Graham is good. Uh, Chris Jenkins is good, and so yeah, I'm worried about it. But Ohio State's going to have to have a plan. I was really worried about Georgia's front last year against the interior of Ohio State's offensive line, and Ryan Day cooked up a game plan that made that all moot because CJ Stroud was rolling out and hitting throws. He was working. Um, quick stuff. He was getting the ball out of his hands when he saw pressure. Like, I think that this offensive line, defensive line conversation is as much on Kyle McCord as it is on Carson Hensman in the interior because Ryan Day is going to have a game plan for Kyle McCord to succeed against a good interior defensive line. Kyle McCord has to go out and execute it. That's just my opinion. I think, yeah, I agree. It's on both. I, I do think this interior defensive line for Michigan is, is a huge threat. I mean, the trio of Kenneth Grant, Chris Jenkins, uh, Mason Graham. I mean, that that is just – that is daunting, especially considering that Carson has been struggled in pass protection this year. And there have been times where that has been the root problem for Kyle McCord and the pressure he's gotten. It's been up the middle. I mean, there's been times, of course, Josh Fryer's given up a team high five sacks. He's been beat. There's been times. But otherwise, like, it's so weird with Josh Fryer. He's been pretty good this year. It doesn't seem like that if you look at the, the stats and you look at the sacks given up because he's given up five. No one else is close to that in Ohio State. But those are just like the glaring mistakes that stick out. Overall, he's been fine. The, the most consistent pressure has come up the middle. And it's been from the spot of Carson Hinsman, which normally your center is not giving up the most pressure on your team. Normally, it's either the left tackle, the right tackle. Josh Simmons has quietly been great. I tweeted about that this week. He's given up four pressures over the last six games combined. Okay, so Josh Simmons, his early season struggles with penalties, pressures given up, missed blocks in the run game. That's not an issue right now. Josh Fryer, for the most part, is solid. I get it. He has those once a game, once every other game. Wow, what just happened? I get it. The problem, the pressure has really been in the interior. Uh, in the early season, John, Donovan Jackson was part of that too. He's gotten better. Uh, we talked about before, Carson Hinsman has made a lot of strides, and I think the hostile environments he had to play in have been key. I think that will help him on Saturday. He's, he's already played in a huge game at you know at his home state in Wisconsin, you know in Camp Randall. I think that's a real environment and a game that it's hard to be composed for. Talk about emotion, right? I mean, that's full of emotion. We saw his whole family. So yeah. many, such a cool moment. <laughs> he's been through that, so I think that. That is something to be said too. Like he's improved in communication. That's so important. It's just the pass blocking that I think is 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 a valid concern going into this game against that interior defensive line for Michigan. Kyle's gonna have to use his legs somewhat if the pocket isn't clean. You are absolutely right. Remember 2018, Dwayne Haskins had not used his legs all year. Used them a little bit against uh Maryland the week before. They escaped that game with a win. Then he goes out and does some things against Michigan with his legs that we hadn't seen all year. And that helped uh, propel this offense to score 62 points against the best defense in the country in Michigan. Ohio State's not scoring 62 points this week, okay? I got a hunch. But if Kyle McCord's using his legs, it helps. It certainly helps. And he's looked healthier every week on that ankle. Um, so I think you could see that. Last week, and I think it was the first drive of the second half, or the second drive of the second half, we're all asking why Kyle McCord is out there. And what does he do? Uh, it's a read option. He pulls one and runs it into the middle of the line. And I'm like, what is this guy doing? Why is he doing this? And it, it might've been two weeks ago, but there was a point in the last two weeks. I can't remember exactly what it was where Kyle McCord pulled a ball and ran through, you know, off tackle a little bit uh, just to show that he's willing to do it. And we were all wondering, well, why is he doing that? Well, you, you might see why this week, because that could be something that we haven't seen all year that Ryan Day pulls out every single year in this game. Every year, there's something we haven't seen all year that comes out in this game. I don't think Kyle McCord is like the most mobile guy ever, but I also think that every time I'm out there on the field pregame, I'm watching him do his routine. And at the end of his routine, he does um, some on the run throws and some like just general running to make sure that he's, you know, warmed up and loose and everything. He's not a statue. And so, do we see that this week? Do we see um an extended pocket do we see rollouts do we see a read option where he keeps it when everybody pays attention to Travion Henderson he picks up nine yards and stays in front of the sticks like 
those are the little tiny things that can make such a huge difference against a defense as good and as aggressive as Michigan is. Do we see Devin Brown? Well, I mean, that, that was that was. I was kind of going to set you up for that. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's yeah, I mean, key. yeah, right. Because he's available now. He has not played since the Penn State game last month. And he's someone that they were starting to use in the red zone. He was a red zone package quarterback. Of course, he's the backup quarterback as well, which is also important, um, given that it, you know, if there's an injury, he would be one play away from stepping in. But we're talking more in this context of will we see him maybe one to five, six snaps in that red zone capacity to equate number about how good Michigan is in the red zone goes back to the earlier discussion. Well, one way to subvert that is to have an extra blocker in there and run the football. And Devin Brown showed that he could do that at Purdue. He showed that he could do that. Well, he almost scored against Penn state while he got hurt with his ankle there. And I think that having him available is huge. It's just another wrinkle. At the very least, it's something that Michigan has to prepare for. In addition, if Kyle McCord will pull the ball on his own read or whatnot. And so it's another wrinkle that Ohio State can rely on. I also think that we have not seen a genuine trick play outside of a fake punt uh, or any kind of end around or pop pass. I mean, I'm not qualifying those as trick plays. We've seen like no flea flicker, double pass. We've seen no genuine trick play. I wouldn't be surprised if we finally get one in this game. I mean, this is the time to pull it out. If you got one, you got to use it. We know how creative Ryan Day is. I'd be surprised if we don't see something. I mean, some kind of Philly special. I don't know, something. Like, they got to use some kind of creativity. They have so many playmakers. Think about all those guys. You can put the ball in their hands. Travion Henderson, Kate Stover, Marvin Harrison Jr., Mecca Buka, Xavier Johnson, Julian Fleming. I mean, there's so many of these players. You want to get the ball to them in space. I'd imagine they have something cooked up. And if we're probably going to see a trick play, it's going to happen this weekend in Ann Arbor. I think the only time, Andy, that I would qualify anything Ohio State's done this year as a true trick play, because I was tricked, because I was watching someone else, was the orbit motion fake end around. Kyle McCord spun back inside and handed it off to Dallin Hayden um, at Purdue. And that's just like a not even a trick play. It's like a, a wrinkle. But Ohio State ran a new wrinkle against Purdue of all teams. And Ohio State kind of unloaded the playbook there against Purdue. They ran a lot of stuff that we just haven't seen all year and we haven't seen since then. A lot of that orbit stuff and the, the, the runs that they had in that game, like it was just like odd, but they put it on film. And they've done some of that orbit stuff a little bit. They did it against Michigan last year or so uh, with Xavier Johnson. So like it doesn't have to be like a true trick, but all of the things that you've done this year and you've put on film this year, there's got to be a wrinkle that nobody has seen that maybe we, because we're so trained to just see so many athletes and stuff. And when you're Ohio State and when you're Michigan, you don't truly have to do a lot of trick plays. But, like, there's got to be some sort of, like, special wrinkle that qualifies as a trick play that, like, you just don't see coming. And, you know, whether that's the end around to Xavier Johnson, Kyle McCord runs a wheel route and Ohio State gets a 71-yard touchdown pass to Kyle McCord. Like, something wild like that, we could probably call a trick play, but really it's just a wrinkle on what they've done all year. Well, yeah, I mean, one we'll wrinkle, but like the we'll Devin see. Brown, you can see like a jump pass. I don't know. Like, mm -hmm. I'm just saying if there's a time to do it, empty the chamber now. I mean, like, you're yep. not saving anything after you don't know if they lose this game. Like, this could be Martin Harrison Jr.'s last game ever at Ohio State. Like, he might opt out of the bowl. Like, I don't know. I mean, you never know. That's what receivers have done in the past here. You just have no idea. You got to empty the chamber. You got to use everything you have. There's nothing to save at this point. There's no guaranteed Big Ten championship. There's no guaranteed college football playoff. You got to use everything. And I would be shocked if we went an entire 12 games and didn't see anything that qualified as like a genuine. I mean, look what Rutgers did. They emptied the, emptied the chamber against Ohio State and they put up a dang good fight in Piscataway. I mean, all the, the trickery that we saw there, even the pass that was intercepted by Jordan Hancock, that was a cool play design by Rutgers there that was, you know, kind of a fake quarterback draw and then a pass. We just I would like to see some of that. Just just empty it out. And I agree with you. We've seen some creative stuff, especially with the two back sets and and everything they've done with Xavier Johnson, as you mentioned, with the pre-snap motion. I get it. But I just feel like there's room for something truly, truly creative. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. I get it. But that's in these big games, you got to make big calls. You got to take some risks. 
Yeah, that's my last key to the game as we transition to which Buckeyes need to step up because Ryan Day absolutely needs to step up. Ryan Day has to – I'm going to keep it PG. Ryan Day's got to be, like, good. And he has to have, like, stones, okay? I'll just say that. Like, be Georgia Ryan Day in the Michigan game. We, we've always categorized – ever since December 31st, we've, we've talked about Ryan Day Georgia – or Georgia Ryan Day and Michigan Ryan Day. Be Georgia Ryan Day – in the Michigan game. If somebody makes a big play, go nuts on the sideline. That helps your team and their morale. If you need a big call, reach into that trick or that bag of, of, of plays that you have, get in your bag and be good. Don't run stretch to the boundary on third and one because you think you can get a yard. Be aggressive. Like everything Ryan Day did in that Georgia game flew directly in the face of what we thought that he was after the Michigan game. I wrote right after the Michigan game, because I've gone back and I've looked at a lot of stuff that we did in the aftermath of the Michigan game last year. Ryan Day strayed from his offensive identity against Michigan and then went back to it against Georgia and damn near won a national title. Be Ryan Day. Don't be a coach against Michigan. Be Ohio State coach and you will be successful. Because if Ryan Day is successful in this game, they're going to win. That's my opinion. If, if if Ryan Day is like Georgia Ryan Day and he has a good day with the play sheet and he's confident in all of his calls and he makes the right decisions, they will win this game. And so I think he's the he is the Buckeye more than anybody inside the 53 and a third and inside the 120, including the end zones. He's the Buckeye that will that this game will hinge on. He has to step up. He has to be good in this game. Kyle McCord. I mean, it comes down to the quarterback, and most importantly for him, he cannot turn the football over. And I'm not even concerned with him throwing an interception. If you look at his four interceptions, which, of course, is not many, they're usually based off of just not necessarily a bad decision. I know the one at Wisconsin sticks out. That was a bad decision. But most of them have just been not great throws. What I'm more concerned about is the fumbling issue he had most of the season. We haven't seen it lately, but – any kind of fumble situation, talk about the Penn State game. If that was actually a scoop and score, Ohio State might not win that game. That would have changed the entire complexion of that game. One play like that against Michigan in a probably a low-scoring game or at least lower-scoring game than we've been accustomed to seeing in this game, the game turns. He cannot turn the football over. And if he does, I would almost rather, if I'm an Ohio State fan, I would rather come forth throw an interception at some point. Now, obviously not in Ohio State territory but then have a fumble because the fumbling stuff is just, it feels like it's contagious and it feels like it's just, they string together. Um, I know people say that about interceptions, but common course decision-making has not been a huge issue this year. I know he's missed some throws. I know he's missed some reads, but the fumbling issue is what concerns me going into this one. He cannot turn the ball over. He needs to do the routine plays routinely. That's been the whole thing this year. And I know that CJ Shroud, Justin Fields, and Dwayne Haskins are all in a different category. I get that. So are Braxton Miller and JT Barrett and all the other guys. Like Kyle McCord is his own quarterback. Um, I get the, the Craig Krenzel comparisons. I get all of that stuff. He's his own quarterback. He needs to be his own quarterback. He can't try to be anyone else. He hasn't been trying to do that this season. He needs to stick to that. Make the right throws. It doesn't have to be flashy. He doesn't need to throw for 300 to win this game. But he needs to find a way to win, and that's what he's done all year. I think you're right. I think that's a good uh, that's a good one. Obviously, Kyle McCord's a good one, but like the, the reasoning is sound. I like that. I'm gonna give one more and then we can go to the five underrated that I picked that I wrote about at lettermanrow.com yesterday. And then we're gonna give our score predictions on here because we also gave them on the bold prediction show that's already out. So the cat's out of the bag. We can do that at the end. Um I'm gonna go with Cody Simon. He has been incredible against the run. He has been so good. A, almost a revelation for this defense this year. Um the step that he has taken forward. From 2021, when he started in this game and had a rough day, okay, like it wasn't great. 2022, he was decent last year. Spot, spotty play, uh, you know, just filling in for Steel Chambers and Tommy Eckenberg at times. This year, he's been so good. And last week, the week before, those two weeks, he was really good. He's shooting through gaps. He's seeing things a lot better. He understands Jim Knowles' defense. I wouldn't be surprised if next year he's the Tommy Eikenberg of this defense and he returns for his senior year and becomes the middle linebacker. Knowles talks about him very highly. Against the Michigan team that wants to establish the run, Cody Simon's going to have to be huge in this game. And he might be put in some coverage situations. Got to be big in those, those two. 
be the Cody Simon we've seen for the last six weeks of the season, Ohio State's going to be successful in defense. I think he might be one of the three or four most important defensive players on this entire in this entire game. I think Cody Simon will have that big of an impact in this game. We saw it at Notre Dame. He made a couple big plays in that <clears> game. <throat> I don't expect him to play more than 20 snaps, to be honest, in this game. But that doesn't mean he can't have an impact. And sometimes he mm -hmm. plays fewer snaps because he's on the field and they're forcing three and outs. So, yep. I mean, that, that's a good deal, right? You're not going to show up and – in terms of participation report high up there, but you could still make a huge impact on the game. So I like that pick. Yeah, let's get into those those five underrated ones. I read that story that you wrote. It was a good one on lettermanrow.com. Uh, but let's start out with, I guess, uh, G. Scott. I don't know. That was at the end of your list, but why not start there? I think that we've seen so much of these two tight end sets with Ohio State. They like the 12 personnel. We know that. G. Scott's always good for a random touchdown one of these days. We saw it against Rutgers. Maybe it happens against Michigan. Tight ends are always big, underrated players in these games. And, you know, maybe it's him that scores a touchdown and not Cade Stover. You never know. But he has been significantly improved since last year. I thought that, you know, yeah, he did have a drop against Rutgers, which stung a little bit. That probably would have been another touchdown to have on his belt. But I thought he's gotten so much better as a blocker. I mean, talk about his receiver transitioning. He's been fundamental in a lot of these touchdowns. So is Julian Fleming on the perimeter. A lot of those touchdowns are those two guys just honestly yep. making a good enough block or a great block to open up the player into the second level, third level, et cetera. Yeah, and like he's going to be on the field a lot because he's the second tight end. And Ohio State wants to run the ball. Like We've seen that from Ryan Day all year now. He wants to run the ball. And with Trayvon Anderson, he can run the ball. And so G. Scott, like you said, huge um, – I'm going to just name a couple. Jihad Carter, he's going to be on the field because he's a little heavier than Jordan Hancock. I don't love the idea of taking Jordan Hancock off the field. Jim Knowles seems to like it, though, especially against run run fits. Jihad Carter might be a little bulkier there to help out when he's got offensive linemen coming at him uh, and trying to get a hat on a hat. Jihad Carter is going to be big. Um, Julian Fleming, I mean, it's obvious. He's the third wide receiver. He's going to be on the field a ton. I'm not even sure how much they're going to rely on Carnell Tate in this game as a true freshman in Ann Arbor. Julian Fleming's been there. Um, He's played in this game. He understands it. I know he doesn't have a win, but he's he's played in this game. He gets it. And you have to – there's a level of understanding the rivalry in this game. that It's just different. It just is. And, you know, he was huge in the Georgia game last year. So Julian Fleming, we already talked about Devin Brown. And then I'm going to go with my, like, sleeper pick for maybe, like, potential, like – I didn't pick him as my defensive player of the game. My bold prediction on lettermanrow.com is Tommy Eichenberg has 15 tackles. He's got to be the defensive player of the game for Ohio State. Under the radar, like sleeper candidate, like long shot odds, Kenyatta Jackson. Watch the Penn State game and what Chop Robinson and Adisa Isaac and Danny Denny Sutton did with the speed rush against Carson Barnhart, the right tackle at Michigan. Carson Barnhart is bad against the speed rush. He's not even like decent. We don't have to sugarcoat it. He's bad. Who's the fastest defensive end on the Ohio State roster? Kenyatta Jackson. If it's an obvious passing down, do not be surprised to see 97 in there rushing the passer. I think he's got very like long shot potential to be one of those key defensive players who could just wreak havoc for Ohio State on third downs. Both Michigan tackle spots are, are kind of a concern right now. You, you mentioned Carson Barnard. Also on the other side, Ladarius Henderson and Miles Hinton were both dealing with injuries that they're supposed to be able to play. I mean, with this week, there's so much gamesmanship. I don't, I don't know what their actual status will be, but both tackle spots are a concern for Michigan. Again, goes back to our earlier discussion that Michigan's off the line, especially on the outside of it, on bookended by those tackles, has been a little bit underwhelming this year. Uh, you know, they've won the Joe Moore Award back to back years. So there was the expectation that this line would still be great. It has definitely taken a little bit of a step back. Still good, but not great. So, yeah, I like all those picks. Uh, Kenyatta Jackson, I think we were expecting him to just have a, a breakout year. He hasn't had that. I mean, there's been moments. But that's – I mean, you're right. There's always someone in this game. I mean, last year, Donovan Edwards from Michigan, everyone thought, well, Blake Horm's going to tough it out. He'll play. Blake Horm doesn't play. Donovan Edwards rips the heart out of everyone in Ohio Stadium in that fourth quarter and has two runs of 75 or more yards four touchdowns, and he was the hero of that game. You know, either side, there's always a player that isn't necessarily a starter that makes an impact, and and that's the hero of that game. And uh, that's why I like the gist of this piece. But I think we would be kind of doing a disservice to everyone if we didn't talk a little bit more about Travion Henderson this morning. Because Travion Henderson 
has just been a revelation for this offense. He's given it balance, which Marvin Harrison Jr. talked about this week. When you have balance, the passing attack gets better. It's not just that they got Cade Stover back and Mecca Buka back. So they got Trayvon Henderson back. And that makes this team more unpredictable in offense. It makes them more versatile in the run game. It makes them have the ability at any moment, like we saw against Michigan State, like we saw against uh, Wisconsin, at any moment, and I guess Minnesota, at, at any moment, he can just turn this game on a dime, break out, hit a home run, as Ryan Day said. And I think the key for Travion Henderson is, even if you can hit home runs, you still need to be okay with singles too. Like you need to be able to do both. And yeah, there could be a home run out there during this game, but maybe there isn't. And he can he still needs to be productive. Like look at the Notre Dame game. He rushes for over a hundred yards, but that's mainly because he has a 60 plus yard touchdown run at the start of the third quarter to help them take a lead in that game. 10, 10 point lead. The rest of that game, he was not as efficient as you would like him to be. They need him to be okay with taking 10 yards or five yards and not always be looking for 60. And he's been better at that since returning. I feel like he's been really good, patient runner, and has great vision. That's a key for me in this game if they want to run the ball effectively. Like you said, it all comes down to who runs the ball better. He needs to be okay with the singles, and maybe a home run comes. Andy, you just said it. Whoever runs the ball better wins the game. Who's running the ball better, a.k.a. who's winning the game? Who you got? I have Ohio State winning. Um, I think a lot of people have been – kind of raising an eyebrow to my score prediction, but I have it 16-13 Ohio State. I, I just – we've seen Ohio State play two matchup games so far this season. They beat Notre Dame 17-14. They beat Penn State 20-12. to This offense doesn't need to be the offense that scores 50 points, 40, or even 30 points. They just need to do enough. They just need to get out of Ann Arbor with a win. And sometimes doing enough is scoring 16 points when you have a defense as good as Ohio State's. I think it's going to be a low-scoring game. That's just that's just my hunch. This guy might be the smartest guy in the chat right now because that's exactly my score prediction, 27-17 Ohio State. I don't think it's a 10-point game throughout. But, buddy, listen, if Ryan Day gets a chance, the man's going to score again. Like, if they're up three, he's going to try to score again. Um, if they're up 10, he's going to try to score again and make it 13 or 17. If Like – He's not going to stop. So if he's got a lead, watch out, because I think Ryan Day is going to be uh, out for a little bit of blood uh, with all the things that have transpired. We didn't even get into the off-the-field conversation, Andy, but that's because, like, we've been doing that for three or four weeks. Like, the Michigan saga is what it is. No Jim Harbaugh on the sidelines. Um, but we've got it all covered at LettermanRoad.com. I did want to make sure everybody sees this. Uh, right now, special offer, $1 for two months of Letterman Row. Two months of Letterman Row for $1. National Signing Day is coming up. The bowl game is going to come up. You can get all of that. College football playoff, potentially Big Ten championship game. The rest of the coverage of the Michigan game. Use the code OSU1 at LettermanRow.com. You get two months for a dollar. Usually it's $1 for one month. You get two months for $1 right now at LettermanRow.com. We would love to have you guys over there. Matt Parker, Alex Gleitman on the recruiting side. Tim May's stories, the 40-year veteran. You know him. You love him. His content resides over there at LettermanRow.com. Andy Baxter and I cover the Buckeyes 365 days a year. Get the first two months for $1. I know you guys want a deal. I know uh, times are tight. That's a great Black Friday deal, too. $1 for two months. It's a YouTube special. Use the code OSU1. Last but not least, Andy, it's not just Ohio State, Michigan. I went 4-1 and one last week on the picks I gave out here. Um Quickly, though, you watching anything this week other than Ohio State, Michigan? You're going to have your eye uh, slanted at one thing. What, what's on your mind, uh, college football week 13? Yeah, I mean, I think it's the rivalry week, right? So Oregon, Oregon State is on my mind because if Ohio State, let's say that they do lose this game, which, of course, makes things so much more difficult than again in the CFP. They need Oregon State to beat Oregon. Uh, they really need Oregon State to beat Washington last week as well. But that's a game that is fun to watch regardless. That rivalry is always great. Kentucky, Louisville, that's always kind of fun. I don't know. Louisville's already got the ACC bid locked up, though. So that one's not as good as usual. Uh, Auburn, Alabama, it's weird that that is, like, so far in second for this week. Like, it, it's not even close. Like, usually the Iron Bowl is, like, somewhat – I know that Michigan, Ohio State is always bigger than that. But, like, it's somewhat comparable at times, like – in the sense where there's excitement building for it. 
I think Paul Feinbaum said it this week. He's like, I feel like I'm just headed to the wrong party. <laughs> like, and, uh, you know, it, but that, that game is always somewhat interesting. I don't know. It's rivalry week. Everyone's got a rivalry they want to watch, but those are a couple that stick out to me. Got five quick ones for you. Uh, Texas Tech plus 13 and a half against Texas. Um, the Horns just don't look like the team that they should be. Um, we got Virginia plus two and a half against Virginia Tech in the Commonwealth Cup. Uh, Rutgers plus two and a half against Maryland. Maryland's not good. So, and they just gave everything they had against Michigan. Um, so I'll take Rutgers plus two and a half. Florida State minus six and a half against Florida. I just think they're too much. I don't care if the backup quarterback's in there. I think Florida State's going to be too much. And then Kansas minus six and a half against Cincinnati. And then, oh, by the way, I'm not taking this because I do not bet on the Buckeyes. They're an underdog. Ohio State is an underdog. Ohio State fans, you don't get this often. Take the bucket. Just do it. Because if they win, you're going to be happy. Your, your uh, FanDuel account's going to be full, and then you can celebrate. So, yeah, what's take the, the bucket. What's the under on that game right now? Isn't it 42? 45 and a half. 45 and a half. Well, if my score prediction is anywhere close, <laughs> take, the, uh, take the under on that. But, yeah. Mine's know. at 44, too. My my score prediction was at 44. Oh, uh, I mean, I guess. I guess I'll take this one because I'm a fat boy. Uh, what do you do with the Thanksgiving turkey leftovers? Everything. I eat it. I don't dispose it, I promise. I eat it. I used to eat it while watching Ohio State, Michigan. But now I'm going to be in the big house with Andy Backstrom from Letterman Row. Andy, what do you say we head up to Ann Arbor? Let's do it. I can't wait. It's going to be the it's so fun. The best week of the year. Is finally over because the best day of the year is here tomorrow at noon. Ohio State, Michigan, in the big house in Ann Arbor. Letter Monroe will be there. Andy, Tim, me, uh, Matt Parker will be there taking photos, trying not to get things hurled at him from uh, angry Michigan fans who think Ryan Day told on him uh, because they cheated again. They cheated. Um, we're going to be up there for full coverage. LetterMonroe.com. Make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel because we're going to have. A rapid reaction directly after. We'll have Ryan Day's press conference immediately after, whether it's celebratory or uh, in a loss. We're going to have the Ryan Day press conference. We'll have full coverage at LettermanRow.com of the game, Ohio State, Michigan. You know this game. You love this game. Your life depends on this game because I know you're crazy Ohio State fans. And that's why what we do is so fun because we get to do it for you. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening to Letterman Live in the uh, day before Ohio State, Michigan. The game is finally here and we'll see you guys up in Ann Arbor tomorrow for the showdown.